I'm a postdoc a researcher at the um, International Center for Ethics and uh, Sciences and Humanities at the University of Tübingen. Um, I'm a philosopher by training and I received my PhD in philosophy from the Humboldt University at Berlin. Um, my main research areas are on the side of practical philosophy, especially um, philosophy of technology, um, um, ethics uh, of AI and uh, robotics, questions of privacy, um, but I also work in political philosophy and social philosophy and also some legal philosophy, so I'm also interested in questions of uh, um, democracy and uh, digital public spheres and the question how um, privacy uh, is affected, privacy affects also the question of how we perceive the public sphere and uh, um, um, becomes problematic for democracy. Artificial intelligence is a really important topic nowadays, so do you want to tell us about what what kind of thoughts do you have about the dangers or the benefits of this kind of technology for society in general? Well, so I think artificial intelligence, at least, you know, the term has been through, I think, uh, uh, most media. But what is mostly meant by it is um, algorithmic processing by using big data and machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, these are technologies that are pervasive, that are moving in, I think, basically into every realm, more or less, if we let them. And the question is whether we should let them. So should we, for example, decide, let an algorithm decide who gets parole or who doesn't get parole? Should we let an algorithm decide who gets um, um, a bank credit? Should we let an algorithm decide whether we, um, whether we get some sort of social benefits or we get a special training to reintegrate the job into the job and all these kind of things. So this is the, I think, the one side. It can go even so far, so far as do we want algorithms to decide our court cases, for example, right? I mean, so there is a possibility and people are discussing it, whether um, algorithmic decisions are not more just um, and more fair. There has been a study where judges um, after uh, right before lunch, uh, handed out harder sentences yep. than after lunch. Mm -hmm. So if that is true, maybe um, maybe there's something to it mm -hmm. saying that algorithms should maybe decide these things. So I think this is the one side. The other side is maybe the robotic side, where algorithms, mm -hmm. um, where some form of artificial intelligence is embodied, embodied. In, in into physical. some mm -hmm. uh, some might be humanoid form, doesn't have to be humanoid form. Um, and we're seeing this especially, um, I mean, so there, there are a couple of topics, we're seeing this in, in, in elder care especially, um, uh, medical care, um, and uh, um, also we have a big discussion about uh, military robots um, and also some discussion about um, um, sex robots. Um, but I think for the foreseeable future, the, probably the most important aspect is going to be um, robots in um, medical care and elder care because we have a big problem at least in most western countries um, to find enough um, uh, um, care workers yep. and to train them properly and most importantly to pay them uh, um, properly yep. so there are big vacancies um, and a lot of uh, uh, um, institutional actors in that um, field are trying to then move on to, um, to other means, especially uh, robotic means, and, and try to not replace, but at least assist some of the mm -hmm. um, elder care workers. Yeah, so do you, do you want to tell us more about, for example, autonomous weapons? Why do you think they, are, they might be dangerous or not? So, because the debate basically, the, there are some people who argue that autonomous weapons can be beneficial because they are more efficient, mm. but we have some empirical data that shows that that kind of efficiency is not, it's not, it's not basically, is not working. Mm. So, because there are a lot of people who are being killed, innocent people that they were not the main target. We have, well, we also have the case of autonomous cars, where basically we have a what we can call the gap, uh, the responsibility gap. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem because basically 
in traditional cars, the human is the responsible if something happens, or the manufacturer if the, the, the car has some problem. But with autonomous cars, we think that the concept of responsibility is, is, is empty now. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about these two cases, the autonomous weapons and right. the autonomous right. cars? Right. So I'm not an expert on autonomous weapons, but I think the big ethical question here is also who should make the decision, right? As I said with the case of the judge, who is actually to decide? And this is important because this is an important decision. It's a decision who should live and who should die, um, basically. Whom am I going to target? Um, and who is a, le a legitimate target? And who is like some civilians or um, non combatants? Um, and these decisions. That's our moral intuition, I think, um, should be left to humans. Now, as you said, uh, autonomous weapons could be more efficient and more efficient in a lot of ways. In the first way, they could be more efficient in singling out the legitimate targets. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of talk in, uh, in the last wars about collateral damage. Um, where civilian, civilians get harmed, yeah. um, where people get mistaken for other people, and maybe um, autonomous weapons will be better at that. Secondly, um, as warfare progresses, decisions have to be taken more quickly. Um, and it might be the case that there is not a lot of time to, like, you know, you have all the information as, you know, a military officer uh, operating, for example, a drone or, or some other uh, automatic, uh, automatic weapon system, and you, but you don't have the time to really assess all the information and you have to rely on what the, um, um, what the automatic s system is giving you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just they're going to give you some color coding, right? Red, mm -hmm. green, yellow. And you're going to decide red, no, green, yes, yellow. Oh, I have to take a closer look. Mm -hmm. So how much of a decision am I, am I actually taking then? Mm -hmm. Or is it that basically I'm just relying on the system and I'm just the one who's pushing the button and it will be for responsibility reasons. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm not taking any decision at all. Um, and I think there has been a big discussion whether they should be in the loop or on the loop or could be out of the loop. In the loop meaning um, they have to actively decide, um, have to actively uh, uh, push buttons on the loop meaning the auto autonomous system can do the decision, but somebody has to supervise it out of the loop, meaning that um, um, humans have no say or have no, no a part in the, in the decision process. And I think, as far as the debate goes, we're, dis we're discussing whether humans, with regard to autonomous weapons, should be on the loop or in the loop. Nobody that I know really uh, uh, suggests that they should, they should be out of the loop. But the efficiency, yeah. the efficiency um, question um, um, is there. So with regard to autonomous cars, I think um, there are a couple of issues that the current debate um, and that also the debate in the media is not covering really, um, or it's not substantially covering. So these trolley cases have been a big uh, uh, part of the media debate. So um, Do you want to tell us what uh, yeah, the trolley um, is? Yeah. I was going to, to say something <laughs> yeah. about that. So the trolley cases are um, work on a, on a couple of assumptions. The trolley cases itself are an invention by Philippa Foote um, where she said, okay imagine there's a trolley coming down a track and um, it's going to kill either one person or five persons and you're the one at the switch and you can decide which way the trolley should go. What's your decision? Would you kill the five in order to save the one? I mean, so that's the where the trolley goes or would you pull the switch and then one is killed and five are saved? And I think what Philippa, I mean, so there are different debates about this, but I think what Philippa Foote thinks the trolley cases show is that our moral intuitions are not consistent. Our moral intuitions, we would say, a lot of people would say, oh, of course I would kill the one and save the five. A lot of people would say the other thing, I, I can't do, so the trolley is going down, killing the five. If I'm changing the switch, I'm actively doing something and I'm killing a person. Um, then there are variations on that, I'm not going to go into that. But this 
in the autonomous car trolley cases work on the assumptions that one day autonomous cars will be, the AI in autonomous cars will be so quick that they can decide um, if there is a dangerous situation. So for example, the car is going over a bridge. There are three kids running after a ball behind, three, uh, behind, <laughs> behind a car. And on the, other hand, on the other side, there's an old lady on a bicycle. So the car could do three things. It could, it's not possible to stop in the right time. So you could either kill the three kids, you could kill or hurt uh, um, the old lady, or it could drive off the bridge and then seriously hurting the passengers, you, um, or even killing them. And that works on the assumption that the autonomous car is not doing something wrong. It's not going at a high speed or anything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's staying within the, the, uh, um, uh, the traffic laws. And also, secondly, um, that the AI will be quick enough to assess the situation and make a decision. So those are the assumptions. And under those assumptions, because a human driver couldn't do it, a human driver would just react and whatever the reaction would be, we, we're not responsible in the sense because our, our decision mechanism isn't quick enough. But if that's the case, then the question becomes, what should the AI do? Or rather, how should we program it, right? And there have been, there have been different solutions. Um, um, I put forward one solution in a paper. I think the problem is with these cases, I think they have to be solved because of acceptance reasons. I'm not gonna, I'm not yeah. gonna buy a car and sit in a car where I don't know what it's gonna do. Okay. Um, and I think we need a societal discussion for this in order to, to solve these uh, um, solve these cases, but come to a come to a workable conclusion. As of now, the um, the um, um, ethics um, committee, the German Federal Ethics Committee, um, um, handed out like a, um, a pre preliminary solution to this problem, saying an AI, an autonomous car, should always break. And should never swerve. It should switch, never go switch, switch lanes or okay. anything. Yeah. And this is a decision. That's not like it seems to be. That's the natural cause for a car to, to go, mm -hmm. right? But it's it's also making the decision, right? I mean, so you can't you cannot not decide these cases. Yeah, you cannot sure. just say yeah, just break. Yeah. You can, um, you can because be then you're hitting your yeah. three kids, right? Yeah. I mean, so you're making one decision. Mm -hmm. So and either. The, Decision could be fine. There are good arguments uh, from the from the federal uh, German Federal uh, um, Ethics Council um, why this should be, but we sh we should have this discussion. At the same okay. time, I think um, there are other uh, um, um, issues with autonomous cars that pertain more to um, a whole societal uh, um, question. Are they really as safe as we wanted? Mm -hmm. them to be there is we've almost forgot this this idea that because yeah of course an autonomous car is going to be much safer than because than a human driver because they don't get tired they don't um uh, uh um they don't get distracted they don't look at their mobile phones mm -hmm. they don't speed they, they don't drive reckless they they're, they don't yell at some other person mm -hmm. they you know they don't do all these human things but they make other mistakes and so, for example, when Joshua Brown was killed in his Tesla, um, he was driving down a highway. Allegedly, he was watching a Harry Potter movie. I think that's not yeah. true. That's, yeah. you know, that's, that, that's still in question. Let's assume, yeah. Let's assume whatever, that, whatever, whatever. But I mean, so there was, there was a, because it was an American mm -hmm. highway, you know, you have these highways where they have uh, lights and, people, and, and other cars can move can in. Move in. There was a big truck moving in, and the, the, the AI mistook the truck for a billboard sign. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, he could have seen, if he would have watched the road, he could have seen the car coming for like seven or eight seconds. Yeah. That's a mistake a human never makes. Mm -hmm. Only if he watches a movie, right? Yeah. Uh, and not watching the street. But these cars make other mistakes. Um, and also, we might react to them differently. So a good, good friend of mine uh, uh, worked for a company that made these high storage uh, facilities where they store stuff and they have autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles um, moving and getting stuff out of there, getting mm -hmm. stuff back in. 
and you have also workers working, uh, walking there. Um, and after the first day, they're intimidated because they're huge vehicles. They're autonomous, autonomously uh, um, uh, um, moving autonomously, mm -hmm. and you think like, "Oh my God, what's going to happen?" But after three days, you, you realize they're going to stop in front of you. Mm -hmm. So they just walk. They never even look. Mm -hmm. They just walk. And he says, "I'm just waiting for an accident to happen because, sir." Eventually, the car cannot stop anymore. Even if the AI is perfect, there's physical limits to what the car can do. Mm -hmm. And we're getting overconfident. It's yeah, called yeah. overtrust in technology. Yeah. And that could happen with cars as well. So I'm thinking there, there are some other issues with autonomous cars. There are also ethical issues, more like the impact on society that we should mm -hmm. think about rather than these trolley cases, which are famous and which yeah. we need to solve. But I think the discussion has been focused too much yeah. on that. So you, you are asking for a more pragmatic discussion about this than just a theoretical or philosophical? Yeah, or I would say so. Okay. I, I say we, we needed a discussion about the trolley cases. It's interesting for the philosophers. I totally mm -hmm. understand that. Um, it's an interesting ethical problem. Um, and and, and, and you know, it can also lead for a few, I don't know, tips for the pragmatic solutions, right? So. It, it, the theoretical discussion can also be useful yeah, for the definitely, pragmatic. Yeah, definitely. But what and you are pointing out is that we should not just do theoretical. Right, and we should move forward. I exactly. think we're, we're at the point where the trolley cases, they're not solvable. That's the point mm -hmm. of the trolley cases. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they pose a dilemma that cannot be solved, and we need to find a practical and pragmatic solution. For Otherwise, those cars are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you, the solution would not be the right one, but it will be. Yeah. One that is useful, let's say, yeah. for society yeah. in general. Yeah. Okay. Artificial intelligence dilemmas, they, they are basically ethical dilemmas. And uh, so as uh, ethical dilemmas, they are part of a specific field of academia called ethics. So a lot of people are trying to solve these problems with only an empirical approach. So do you think ethics or the philosophical methods are useful to discuss all these kind of topics mm -hmm. or do you think science can do the work mm -hmm. by itself or do you think we need a cooperation between the two enterprises? Mm -hmm. So I mean as a philosopher I'm a, I'm a bit biased. Um, I would assume that um, we uh, would knock on wood have to say something about uh, and these things. Um, so I I think it has to be a cooperation because as we're like most of these questions um, are questions of applied ethics mm -hmm. and applied ethics most always the, 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 the argument a, a normative argument of, of applied ethics has a descriptive premise and a normative premise um, and, and the normative premise is something that sci science I mean, so you mean natural science and empirical data and these kind of things cannot provide, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so if you if you say something um, normatively, uh, you uh, um, um, you should quit smoking, for example. Then you have I say tell you you should quit smoking. Then I have a normative and an empirical premise. I have the empirical premise that smoking is bad for mm -hmm. your health. And the normative premise that you should uh, um, um, that you should uh, uh, um, watch out for your health, and that being healthy is better than not being healthy, mm -hmm. and that's something that is cannot be solved empirically, right? Mm -hmm. The normative premise is something that you know, and now it depends on what your meta-ethical uh, stance is, whether you think there is some universal normative truth out there mm -hmm. that we need to find. Yeah. Whether you think that you know these kind of truths uh, um, are constructed by our um, by our theories, or, or whether you think those are just you know fiction, so, yeah. yeah, and and just and, and ethics is descriptive in in the sense that you know those are the moral intuitions of our mm -hmm. uh, society, and our society tells us that health is better than. Uh, being healthy is better than not being healthy, but another society could say you know, different ways. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think the, this whole normative side, um, um, uh, the, the, the methodology of it, the epistemology of it, and also the normative ethics of it is something that natural science um, and empirical facts can only help us very little. They can provide, in the applied ethics case, they can provide us the empirical data whether smoking is really affecting your health, mm -hmm. um, but it can, cannot say something about the normatives. Okay, so basically what you are saying is that you are not advocating for the idea that ethics can be done only by a priori methods, but we should also incorporate the knowledge from empirical science, but that's not the only thing that we need. We also need the theoretical approach to, to empirical data, and that should be a cooperation. Right, at least in the, in the, in the field of, I mean, so there are fields Applied in ethics, ethics. Where, mm -hmm. where, where we don't need empirical facts. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could do with some, some uh, um, um, thought experiments. Exactly. But um, in, in, in the questions of AI uh, um, and, and uh, robot ethics, we need the empirical data, and we need the uh, um, we need the empirical facts about what AI can do and what big data algorithms actually mm -hmm. do or not do in order to make uh, um, because this is applied ethics and mm -hmm. in order to do the framework. It's a different story if you're thinking about maybe uh, uh, um, um, philosophy of mind and 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 debating the question whether AI could, in principle, mm -hmm. be intelligent or something, or whether it, being intelligent is always like a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I think is. So, <laughs> I'm not a philosopher of mind. Uh, I'm, 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 you're the expert on that, <laughs> but I would I would assume that that there is some empirical, psychological, and neuroscience facts about the human brain, but I think um, the question what, you know, um, mind and intelligence really means is something that we normatively probably put out there, I would say. There are a bunch of cinematic representations of artificial intelligence in general, so do you have like a preferred movie that basically shows some intuitions about these kind of dilemmas? Mm. So, I mean, there are a lot of um, um, movies out there that, um, that, that um, you know, um, take up this topic, and I think most of them are useful for something, um, and if only to see how society views this topic right now, right? I mean, so, um, so these technological utopias tell us more about ourselves and our current society, usually, than they tell us about um, what the um, um, what the the technology at hand actually does. However, there are some. I mean, so the for example the um, um, the series Westworld. Um, if you're talking about robot rights, is um, very useful to see whether um, 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 artificially intelligent autonomous robots can actually have something as rights, whether they could be moral agents even, um, or at least moral patients, uh, um, be part of our moral universe, um, like children are, like animals are. Um, um, so there is, uh, there is uh, um, Ex Machina um, that you know addresses the idea of of love and sex with robots about attraction, um, where I think we will we will I mean we can see some some of the problems that come up with uh, um, with sex robot especially also with regard to manipulation. Um, there's Black Mirror that you know does a lot of uh, um, good examples and, and gives very, in my opinion, very creepy. I can't watch more than one episode at a time because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like it gets to me. Mm -hmm. um, because they really pinpoint and put over the top whatever topic they take up. And it's topics of, of technology that is already there or almost there. Mm -hmm. So, so it is, is, it's very imminent and very, uh, uh, very uh, useful to see. I like the movie Her. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it shows what what um, 
what artificial intelligence might be capable of, and and not in terms of Skynet and and and, mm -hmm. and Terminator, but in terms of it doesn't have to be as as uh, um, mm, Sam Harris says it doesn't have to be that they're malevolent. Yeah, if we evil. ever get there to something like a a, a super intelligent, mm -hmm. but they just have their own ideas and their own goals, and if they collide. They might just think, well, this species of human beings hmm, who needs worse. them, yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. so we don't hate ants. That's that's mm -hmm. the that's the, the uh, analogy. Um, example mm -hmm. that Sam Harris. We don't hate ants, but if we build something and they're ants, we're going to annihilate them mm -hmm. um, because they're in our way. Mm -hmm. And so, and in, with her, it's you know, it's more a benevolent uh, kind of super AI, but it it has this still this very creepy feeling that there is some entity. That becomes almost, yeah. I mean, so in the movie, it becomes almost godlike yeah, yeah. because it's so uh, uh, omnipotent, um, and we don't understand it anymore, uh, really. I don't think that is something that comes in the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do think is is is, uh, is possible that we um, that we underestimate it because usually that's the problem with technology. Always, it's very mm -hmm. slow in the beginning, and then the last couple of years it really speeds up and then before we know it who uh, um, it happened um, and I think her is, is, is a very is a very good movie to get a feeling for for what that could be like okay